1 Corinthians 15, 13 to 14. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Now, there are many days when you can very easily drop into thinking faith is futile, because uh, life can be tough and difficult, and if you don't feed your faith, that's what you've told. But Paul is saying, your faith is futile if Christ wasn't raised. It doesn't depend on us, it doesn't depend on our emotions and our feelings, it depends on the realities, the objective historical realities, where things actually lie. If Christ wasn't dead, raised from the dead, then your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Now, you get the odd debate every now and again amongst theologians about whether the cross or the resurrection are most important. This shows one thing in particular, theologians have too much time on their hands. What Paul seems to be saying here, amongst other things, is that the question is a nonsense question. Books have been written about it, books by good people have been written about it, but Paul is telling us that cross without resurrection is vain, and of course resurrection without cross wouldn't be happening. So here's the point. You can't deny the resurrection and keep the central issue of Christianity, says Paul. Because that central issue is not ethics of some sort or another, or love, or something of that sort, but the forgiveness of sins. And the central issue in Christianity is that Christ died for our real sins to turn away the real, genuine, just, righteous anger of God at the way we, his creation, have behaved in his world with the life he's given us. And that having paid the whole price of that sin, we're talking cross, that sin, we have ceased to be liable for the penalty of our sins. And we know that's the case because Christ ceased to be liable for the penalty that he bore. Because having paid the penalty of sin, which is death, he then rose from the dead to show the penalty of being fully paid. Without Christ rising from the dead, what is his death? It's a disaster and it's a failure because he's still having to pay the penalty of it if he's still dead. The wages of sin is death. The fact is he's paid that off and therefore is back to life. And the trouble is that most of us have no previous experience of anything quite so unusual as someone being raised from the dead. People find it hard to believe things they haven't seen, don't they? Things that lie outside our previous experience. And the temptation, the temptation is there to be selective about how radical a set of things to believe. To make the belief set a little more respectable in our fundamentally secular society. It's not a new temptation to us. It's been around for a long time. So Paul writes about 55 AD. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. And he's doing it for people who are beginning to question. Two fundamental questions and answers then for this Easter. First question, has Christ been raised? Second question, has sin been forgiven? Okay, well if Christianity's central beliefs are to be upheld, we need to be clear then about this. Has Christ been raised? Why is it held that Christ has been raised? Why do we believe that? The reasons for the resurrection lie in two groups. Firstly, first set of reasons, there's the documented eyewitness accounts. Secondly, there's the testimony to his ongoing life. So first of all, there are these eyewitnesses and, and there are the accounts that have come down to us from them. Let's look first of all at who these people were. In 1 Corinthians, we know there were others in the Gospels, but in 1 Corinthians, Paul says here, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, before our verses, he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve, that's the twelve disciples, twelve apostles. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, so you could check it out with them, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. So who were these people? Well, they were from amongst the twelve who'd lived cheek by jowl with Jesus for the last three years or so, watching his every move, hearing pretty much his every word. And familiarity normally breeds contempt. But these men went straight from being disappointed and distressed at the death of Jesus and the disaster of it all, they went straight from that to awe and worship. 
and the laying down of their own lives for this Jesus because he'd been raised from the dead. They were the twelve. Then there were five hundred of his followers at one time, and they went straight from disillusionment and despair to a determination to put their lives on the line for Jesus as well. And then there was James, and then all the apostles who would actually stake their lives and die for the truth of the resurrection. All put their faith in the fact that the Jesus they knew and saw killed and saw entombed had been raised. Not all of the eyewitnesses I wanted to believe it. By no means. All of them had a mind to believe it. Paul says, finally there in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 15, Last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Paul, Saul of Tarsus. Another who would live, then eventually stake his life on the truth of Christ's bodily resurrection and the things that Paul went through in his life. Because Jesus had been raised from the dead and he was sure of the fact that he'd seen him and he knew him. The things that Paul went through, astonishing. Because he believed this truth. Because he'd seen and met with this Jesus. Paul, when he met with Jesus, was in no sense open to consider the claims of Christ on his life. When he was met by the risen Lord Jesus on the road, he was off to persecute the followers of Jesus, to, to put to death the people who believed in the resurrection. In fact, he'd been there for the stoning of Stephen, organising and overseeing the whole proceedings. So these guys, there were many others, but these are the ones Paul's mentioning here, were the sort of people who were the eyewitnesses of the resurrection, and they were happy to stick around and answer questions about it. And they'd given us their accounts. There's a picture of one there. Coming out very well in the bright sunlight, but there's one there. That's part of 1 Corinthians um, itself, actually, we're looking at today. These people, their accounts are recorded in the Gospels and in Acts. Copies of that exist from within the lifetime of their contemporaries. And these accounts were open to examination within years by the people who were also eyewitnesses of the resurrection and by the people who wished pass passionately it had never happened and tried to deny it but failed. Because they had no case. <clears throat> We've got these accounts. Now you would have thought, wouldn't you, that when so many people witnessed the same events, there'd be disagreement about quite how it was. But although the resurrection accounts in the Gospels were clearly written by very different people from very different backgrounds, there wasn't any significant disagreement at all. What are the odds of getting 500 people in one place, all agreeing about a major event they've all witnessed? and sticking by those accounts when it cost them dearly to do so. More than that, the accounts that we have have come down to us through a set of credible documents. They come down to us in a credible manuscript tradition. What do I mean? I mean there are two strong manuscript arguments that indicate the historical evidence for Christ's death and resurrection is compelling. Firstly, there's the sheer number of early manuscripts that are available to back up, to corroborate one another. Now, I thought it might be interesting, so I've got a table here to show you what I mean. You see that? There are these historical sources in the ancient world that are given a great deal of weight. Letters of Pliny, for example. Okay. Roman writer, Roman governor of the province of Bithynia, wrote 61 to 1, AD. The earliest copy we've got of Pliny, who wrote 600 or so years, 750 years before, um, the earliest copy we've got of Pliny is 850 AD. Now for the New Testament, we've got bits and pieces of John's Gospel going back to within the lifetime of the people who were around. Herodotus, well-respected Greek historian. The earliest copy we've got of anything he wrote was 1300 years after the first and was written down. We've only got seven copies of Pliny, but check it out, we've got eight copies of Herodotus, eight of Suetonius, with an 800 year gap between the original and the first copy. Thucydides, well respected Greek historian, we take it as pretty much as read with Thucydides, 900 AD is the earliest copy, there's 1300 years between the first copy we've got and when it was written down, no chance to, to be checking that out very much, only eight copies. 
and so on and so on. On it goes. With the New Testament, we've got less than a hundred years. We've got less than that actually between the uh, original and the first copy, and we've got five thousand six hundred copies to be able to check out that they copied it accurately and handed it down faithfully. Now, no one suggests that Pliny's historicity is compromised by there only being seven copies of what he wrote coming down to us. No one suggests Caesar's Gallic Wars is unreliable because there are only ten copies to be compared to see that we've got the right text in our hands. 5,600 copies written within the lifetimes of people living through those events, supporting and corroborating the historicity of the text we've got about the resurrection. The sheer weight of the evidence for the New Testament's historical account of the resurrection is overwhelming. Historically, it's a well-established fact. So, we're establishing the accounts we're recorded in credible documents that come down to us in a credible tradition. We're saying there are two strong manuscript arguments that indicate the historical evidence for Christ's death and resurrection is compelling. First, the sheer number of early manuscripts. And second, the manuscripts we've got corroborate one another very, very strongly. They back each other up strongly, except where we know that there were people about who made these copies with reasons of their own for fiddling a bit, in line with their own ends and agendas. Now historically that means the account of the resurrection that we've got in the New Testament is very, very reliable indeed very famous historian, Lord Dacre of Glantz and Hugh Trevoropa says, the best attested fact in the ancient world is that Jesus Christ died and was raised from the dead. Has Christ been raised from the dead? See, this isn't just the answer of faith. Historically, the accounts are reliable, so yes. Yes, he has. And Paul spells out the implications of that pretty clearly for us. If Christ hasn't been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Well then, if Christ has been raised, far from futile, it's not only justified, but fruitful. And here's the second major line of evidence that corroborates the resurrection. And it's one that we shouldn't forget. That risen Lord Jesus, who historically, yes, we can see the case, that risen Lord Jesus still impacts in the present, and still impacts and influences, in fact inhabits, the lives of people he goes on calling to himself. He's not just risen some point in history and returned back to glory, he's risen, he's alive, and he's living in the experience of his people. So lives continue to be touched and changed, unusual, unexpected, unpredictable people's lives are changed, as they go on meeting with the still living Jesus. The implication of Jesus the Saviour being still alive is that he goes on saving people's lives. So Paul writes, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sin. And here's the second thing, here's the second question. Has Christ been raised historically? Yes. In present experience? Yes. Has sin been forgiven then? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And he says this, and this is very significant. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Okay, so we come across from time to time, clergymen, ministers, who for some reason best know for themselves, find themselves denying the resurrection of Jesus. We've had in this town, not terribly distant past, a minister, a non-conformist type minister, who uh, was absolutely clear that he didn't believe in any form of life after death. Most to be pitied, says Paul. Most to be pitied. Paul directly links Christ having been raised from the dead to the actual forgiveness of sins. Without that, what's the point? Has sin been forgiven? Paul, the ex-Pharisee, links it to the whole theology of forgiveness. The kicks off in the Old Testament. 
See, we grew up knowing a lot about sin and atonement. I say sin because we know it close to. But Paul grew up knowing a lot about sin and atonement from his upbringing in Judaism, from his teaching of the stuff he learned in his, uh, what we call Sunday school. And those ideas don't sit at the root of our culture, but they sat at the root of his. And in Paul's spiritual formation, sin was a clearly established phenomenon. It was clear in his mind that God as the creator had the right to legislate in God's world. And he had done so, being defied and continues to be defied as sinful human nature erupts to the surface of our lives to this very day. Paul's background it taught him a lot about sin and atonement. But more than being clear about what sin is, Paul's upbringing and training in God's word led him to see clearly that sin always brings judgment. It brings about the coming upon yourself of the righteous anger of God for sin. Now, over against that negative side of the issue, the Old Testament goes to great trouble to spell out how God deals with that problem of sin. You can see up there, got a picture on the wall of the, you know, the Jewish temple and its, its sacrificial system. Paul was clear in his mind about the consequence of sin being passed to a sacrificial victim whose life is laid down to pay the penalty of sin. But you know, this is the interesting thing. During the entire period of the Old Testament, there was never, there was not ever a case of any one of those bulls and goats getting up and walking away from the altar. And the reason is obvious. Not one thing in the whole of that Old Testament sacrificial system was ever able to fully pay the price of sin. If it had, then the victim would have got up and walked away. Never happened under that whole system. The Bible says, in Hebrews 10 if you like, the Bible says the old system was just a foreshadowing of what was to come. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, Hebrews 10.1. Not the realities themselves. And for this reason it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise wouldn't they stop being offered? For the worshippers would have been cleansed once for all. Would no longer have felt guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That old system was just a foreshadowing of the stuff that was to come. Hebrews 10 then quotes Psalm 40, which prophesies Jesus. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am, I've come, it's written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will, my God, your Lord <coughs> is within my heart. See, there was an understanding throughout those Old Testament days that God was going to do something other than the Old Testament sacrificial system, all that stuff at the temple, to actually pay the price of sin. And here comes Jesus in a body, dying the death of the cross. And there's a lot more Old Testament prophecy about him dying on the cross to pay the price of sin than that. You can look at Isaiah 50, verse 6. You can look at Isaiah 53. You can look at Psalm 34. 20. All about his bones not being broken the way Jesus' were on that cross. You can look at Zechariah 11.13 and see the, the price that was paid for him. He was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. It's all there in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before the event. But the central issues in the Old Testament about what the cross did are in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Psalm 22 goes like this. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. And poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. There's a fairly adequate description of what's going on in crucifixion. My mouth is dried up like a pot, so remember Jesus cried out on the cross, I thirst. They pierce my hands and my feet. Here's a description of the crucifixion centuries before this method of execution was invented in Persia. They divide my clothes among them, they cast lots for my garment. That happened at the foot of Christ's cross, as the, as the soldiers thought they wouldn't tear up his clothes. They'd cast lots for his clothing. And here's what Psalm 22 goes on to say. As a consequence of all of this, 
All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness. Declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. What did he cry on the cross? His final cry. I have done it. And then you look into Isaiah 53. And here again a description of much more close description, close detailed description of the way that he was going to pay the price of sin by his death on the cross. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Paul knows all this. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Paul knew that. And when he sees that Christ has been crucified in the way that he has in fulfilment of all that Old Testament scripture, which speaks about, prophetically, speaks about that happening to pay the price of sin, Paul knows that by Christ's death and resurrection the price of sin has been paid because it fulfills all that prophecy. Now, the New Testament picks up on all that background. What it says is not just that Christ truly was raised from the dead, we've seen that, but that the forgiveness of sin was the result of his dying and rising from the dead. And you can see why Paul's saying that, is because that fulfills all the prophecies about that. In detail. Day after day, every priest stands, Hebrews 10, performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest, talking about Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Job finished. And since that time he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he's made perfect forever. Those who are being made holy. And the New Testament can say that because it can look back and see the fulfillment of all those prophecies about it. You get the same teaching in Romans, in Romans 3. Sin has been forgiven. Christ's resurrection shows the price has been paid. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, judging sin on Christ on the cross. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So has sin been, forgiven? sin been forgiven? Yes, you've got the Old Testament background and the New Testament testimony to its fulfilment. But then there's just one more thing. You need to consider the revolution in lives that we observe of people who've been crippled by guilt and sin and shame, whose lives have been transformed by the mercy of God in Jesus and coming to know and trust in Him, by turning from sin, trusting in Jesus and seeing what it does in people's lives to this day. <clears throat> Are you still asking us to believe that Christ died and rose from the dead? How can that be? How can that happen? The youth club was saying that just, just a couple of weeks back. How can somebody rise from the dead? Well, you haven't seen it yet. But there is this to consider too, and it's a bit challenging in my opinion. In New Testament times, there were instances of those who were being raised from the dead, and you could go and speak to them. You could actually speak to Lazarus after Christ raised him from the dead. Uh, you could speak to Paul after he was uh, stoned in Lystra in Acts 14, surrounded by the believers who prayed for him, and then he walked back into the city. Or you could go to um, Ephesus, and you could talk to Eutychus, who had been sat in the window while Paul's preaching went on and on until after midnight, and fell out of the window and fell to the floor and was picked up dead on the ground below. He fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead, says Acts 20. And Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Very much like Elisha, the prophet had done with somebody many, many centuries before. 
Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left. And the people took the young man home alive. And were greatly comforted because this guy had been raised from the dead. Now to us that looks a bit bizarre, doesn't it? Go on. So you know the guy who fell out the window? Yes, Eutychus, yeah. Yeah, was he, did he like, was he so bored that he died? Bored to death? Mm -hmm. No, he <clears> fell out the window. What we're told is that he was seated in the window, I'll read you this bit. Seated in the window was a young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. Can you identify with that? And he was sitting on the window sill. Yeah. And when he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. So he was bored to death? I think he had possibly had a challenging day and Paul's sermon lasted quite a long time. Yeah. I'm sure he wanted to be there. Yeah. But sometimes you can't help falling asleep when it goes on a bit. I'm about to finish. Now all, this whole thing about people falling to the ground and, and being, uh, whatever the circumstances, dying and being raised from a sense was a bit bizarre, isn't it? We don't expect that. We expect the church to visit the sick and bury the dead, not heal the sick and raise the dead. But I've been looking at a book recently which has been quite interesting indeed, a very unusual book. And that book comes out of a research project looking at how the church undergoing persecution today deals with that and survives that persecution. In their experience it happens that God raises dead people even today. And these things are documented for us. And it appears that in churches that have very little that we have and enjoy and who are under pressure that we know nothing about for their faith in Christ, there are instances of God raising dead people today. In fact, it appears that not they, but we in the sceptical, secular West are the ones that are out of line here. Because in Matthew 10, when Jesus sends out his followers, he sends them out to do this. Listen, Matthew 10, verse 7. As you go, proclaim this message, the kingdom of heaven has come near. can do that, not a problem. Verse 8. Heal those who are ill. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you receive, freely give. Look, Jesus says it's ordinary. Well, apparently it is in his extraordinary kingdom. But we don't see it. And that's the problem. It's not that he hasn't done it. So, conclusion Christ has been raised. You can see it in the strength of the historical testimony, the fact and the effect of the living Jesus on the lives of his people to this day. <clears throat> it's more than that. Because by his death and resurrection, Christ demonstrates that at last the price of sin has been paid. Christ rose from the dead indicating that the price of sin has been fully paid up, so that the penalty of sin is spent and has gone, death has gone, he has been raised. So Paul says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you're still in your sins. But he has been raised. Historical fact. Demonstrable experience. So your faith isn't futile, and faith isn't futile. Because the resurrection shows that Christ has dealt with sin. Your faith, should you choose to accept it, puts right with God. And here's the evidence. And the decision is yours.